Tonight, several developing stories as we come on the air. Former President Trump doubling down on his controversial comments. Republicans forced to defend him. Meta reportedly under Justice Department scrutiny over alleged profits from the sale of illicit drugs. And New Mexico police close in on a suspect in the killing of a state trooper. First tonight, the battle for the White House. President Biden slamming former President Trump after Trump said there would be a, quote, bloodbath if he didn't win. Trump's campaign says he was talking about the auto industry. The current president arguing democracy and freedom are under attack. Trump doubling down, defending his controversial rhetoric about immigrants. Our team standing by. The dramatic capture in New Mexico, a suspect wanted in the killing of a state trooper who had stopped to help him on the side of the road. That suspect also a person of interest in the death of a paramedic in South Carolina. The stunning details on what led to his capture and who tipped off police. The quiet protest in Russia with Vladimir Putin certain to win a fifth term. How ordinary citizens are showing their opposition. Facebook parent company Meta reportedly under scrutiny by the Justice Department over whether the social media giant may have profited from the sale of illicit drugs. The reaction just coming in from Meta. The spring break crackdown, another Florida city now facing a surge as the party moves north. Our team from Fort Lauderdale tonight. The urgent search for Riley Strain, the college student last seen in Nashville more than a week ago. The emotional appeal from his family. The shakeup in the housing market, the new rules that could be a game changer. What it all means for buyers, sellers, and the industry. The change in the weather, winter returns for half of the country. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us on this Sunday. I'm Mary Bruce in for Lindsey Davis. We begin here with the race for the White House and former President Trump's campaign now on the defensive after his fiery rhetoric at a rally in Dayton, Ohio on Saturday night. Trump warning while discussing the economy that there would be a, quote, bloodbath if he is not reelected in November. This after the former president kicked off the event by paying tribute to those who attacked the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. President Biden's campaign swiftly denouncing the those comments as threats of political violence. But even Republicans like former Vice President Mike Pence, who says he will not endorse Trump, are defending his bloodbath comment, saying he was referring to imports hurting the automobile industry. ABC's Mary Alice Parks leading us off tonight from Washington. Tonight, Republicans forced to defend former President Donald Trump's controversial comment while discussing economic tariffs that there would be a bloodbath if he lost the 2024 election. We're going to put a 100% tariff on every single car that comes across the line, and you're not going to be able to sell those cars if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. Trump's campaign pushing back, saying he was only talking economics, writing Joe Biden's insane EV mandate will slaughter the American auto industry. Even Mike Pence, who says he will not endorse his former boss, coming to Trump's defense. The president was clearly talking uh, about the impact of, of imports devastating the American automotive industry. Was so, that clear to you? Because uh, it was I, 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 a little I think muddled. It was. But Trump's remark did not come in a vacuum. He started the Ohio event Saturday telling the audience to stand and pay tribute to those who attacked the Capitol on January 6th, trying to stop the certification of Biden's election win many of whom have been convicted of serious crimes ranging from assaulting officers to seditious conspiracy. And they were unbelievable patriots. Biden's campaign yeah, firing back. I mean, what I heard was a continuation of the same rhetoric, the same endorsement of political violence that we've seen from Donald Trump for years. Trump also ramping up his dehumanizing rhetoric towards certain migrants with the border battle, a major election issue. If you call them people, I don't know if you call them people. In some cases, they're not people, in my opinion. But I'm not allowed to say that because the radical left says that's a terrible thing to say. Trump doubling down on his comments today. That if you don't use certain rhetoric, mm -hmm. if you don't use certain words that maybe are not very nice words, uh, nothing will happen. 
Now, Mary, the Biden campaign today also said that it raised $53 million in February with the Democratic National Committee, that they now have about $150 million cash on hand. That's a considerable fundraising advantage compared to Trump and the Republican National Committee. They haven't released their February numbers yet, but had about $40 million cash on hand in January. Mary. And the general election just getting started. Mary Alice, thank you. Now to the intense manhunt for a suspect in the fatal shooting of a New Mexico state trooper now over. Jeremy Smith in custody after being shot and wounded during a shootout with police. He's also a person of interest in the death of a South Carolina paramedic. The chilling new details coming in tonight about Smith's capture. Here's ABC's Melissa Adon. Tonight, the urgent manhunt for a murder suspect ending in a dramatic shootout. Authorities capturing the man wanted in two cross-country killings of a police officer and paramedic, all because of the careful eye of a gas station clerk who asked us not to show her face. He bought his pack of cool cigarettes. When I carted him, I seen his ID. It was from South Carolina. The spelling of his name, I knew who he was. Police tell us after Jeremy Smith was spotted at that gas station a mile away from here, he was then caught running towards these homes. That's when officers began shooting at him and then took him into custody. Shots were fired. Some shots strike Smith. We don't know the amount right now or how many. Police say Smith is a person of interest in the death of 52-year-old Fenicia Machado IV, a South Carolina paramedic reported missing Thursday. Police say Smith stole Machado Ford's white BMW and drove 1,500 miles across the country to Quay County, New Mexico, where he got a flat tire on I-40 early Friday. 35-year-old New Mexico State Police Officer Justin Hare, a five-year veteran of the force, was dispatched to help. Smith shooting Hare twice, stealing his patrol car with Hare still inside, police say, and later abandoning it and the injured officer on the side of the road. He offered help to a person he thought was in need. That person killed him in cold blood. A family spokesperson tells ABC News Hare leaves behind two young daughters and his girlfriend, who is pregnant with their third child. Those are little girls. No little girl should grow up without a father. Mary, authorities say no one else was injured in this shootout. Meantime, New Mexico State Police say Smith has an extensive criminal history. He's facing multiple charges, including first-degree murder and armed robbery. Mary. Melissa, thank you. Overseas now to the final day of voting in Russia's three-day presidential election. Thousands protesting Vladimir Putin's rule and expected victory by forming long lines to vote against him. Let's get right to Lama Hassan in London tonight. And Lama, Putin is already celebrating. And what is he now saying about the death of late opposition leader Alexei Navalny? Yeah, Mary, Vladimir Putin winning a fifth presidential term appears to be a mere formality. Just moments ago, appearing on TV, thanking his supporters. State-run exit polls indicating that he's winning by a landslide with over 87 percent of the vote. The elections come a month after Putin's main political rival, Alexei Navalny, died in an Arctic penal colony. Navalny's widow, Yulia, and his allies calling for protests at noon today, with her taking part in one at the Russian embassy in Berlin, casting a vote for her husband. Now, at that event, moments ago, that TV event, Putin claiming he agreed to the idea of releasing Navalny just days before he died on the condition that Navalny leave Russia. Now, as for those protests, thousands more demonstrators causing long lines at polling locations inside Russia as well as around the world, many spoiling their ballots or voting for other candidates. Rights monitoring group saying more than 70 people have been detained, though none of this affecting the outcome. President Putin has already scheduled a victory parade tomorrow in Moscow, Mary. Putin's victory all but certain. Lama, thank you. Turning now to Israel, preparing to launch a controversial offensive in Rafah. That's despite mounting international pressure to abandon the plan. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says, though, it is the only way to defeat Hamas. More now from ABC's Matt Gutman in Jerusalem tonight. Tonight, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu refusing to yield to international pressure, vowing to move forward with an assault on the southern Gaza city of Rafah, despite growing criticism from the U.S. and other allies. We're going to do it while we enable the civilian population in Rafah to leave, as we've done up to now, but we have to finish the job. The IDF tells ABC News the military operational plan includes humanitarian islands to provide food, shelter and medical care to the 1.5 million displaced Palestinians in Rafah. 
But today, White House officials telling ABC's Martha Raddatz they haven't reviewed any such plans. We've not seen those plans. Um, and as we've said before, Martha, we would not support such an operation unless or until they can accommodate the 1.5 million refugees that are there. Aid is starting to come in by land, sea and air. It's not nearly enough. UNICEF says that one in three children in northern Gaza is suffering acute malnutrition. We were recently at a border crossing near Rafa. These are some of the dozens of trucks flowing from Israel into Gaza every day. And Israel is now saying that the critical shortage in humanitarian aid on the Gazan side is not because these trucks are not being allowed through. It's because the U.N. is unable to pick up the goods on the other side. They're actually just rotting right there on the other side of the border. The U.N. telling us tonight active firing zones have made deliveries more than high risk. Mary, ceasefire and hostage negotiations are set to resume as early as tomorrow in Qatar. But we've learned of a new key Israeli demand that no adult males be allowed to return to northern Gaza, which has been mostly cleared of Hamas. Mary. We know you will be following this closely. Matt, thank you. Next tonight, tech giant Meta is reportedly under investigation for alleged sales of illicit drugs on its platforms, which includes Facebook and Instagram. The Wall Street Journal reporting that federal prosecutors have issued subpoenas as part of a criminal grand jury probe. So how is the company responding tonight? Here's ABC's M. Wynn. Tonight, federal authorities investigating tech giant Meta over concerns it's benefiting from the sale of illicit drugs first reported by the Wall Street Journal. Prosecutors in Virginia reportedly issued subpoenas as part of a criminal grand jury probe into the parent company of Facebook and Instagram. ABC News confirming a subpoena was also sent to the Alliance to Counter Online Crime, seeking their research and records on violative drug content on Meta's platforms and or the illicit sale of drugs via Meta's platforms. Meta, defending its efforts against bad actors online, saying in a statement to ABC News, the sale of illicit drugs is against our policies, and we work to find and remove this content from our services. The Department of Justice has declined to comment. Facebook in the news again just weeks after senators on Capitol Hill demanded social media executives do more to protect children online. There's both great things that people can do and there are harms that we need to work yeah. to. Remarkably, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg turning to parents in the room who said their children took their own lives because of abuse on social media, offering a rare public apology. I'm sorry for Mary, Meta also telling ABC News tonight that government policies on online prescriptions were relaxed during the beginning of the pandemic and may have contributed to the problem. It's also worth noting these federal probes don't always end in formal charges. Mary. And thank you. We turn now to spring breakers flocking to a new location after that crackdown in Miami Beach. ABC's Andrew Dimbert is in Fort Lauderdale tonight. And Andrew, what's happening there tonight? Mary, there's been a bit of a party pilgrimage, you could say, from Miami Beach up here to Fort Lauderdale Beach, and that's because the word is out. Miami Beach officials say they are done with spring break and acting arguably the toughest restrictions yet. So now those large crowds looking to keep the party going have flocked north to nearby Fort Lauderdale Beach. Vacationers we spoke to say it's that midnight curfew on South Beach that brought them up to Broward. And already there have been arrests and crimes here, according to authorities, including even battery on an officer. And there's a noticeably different tone, too. You can tell it's spring break with bars and restaurants on the waterfront packed. And despite those incidents, officers I've spoken to say that they have things under control and they are on patrol. But unlike Miami Beach here in Fort Lauderdale Beach, there is no curfew. Mary? The spring break chaos continues. Andrew, thank you. Now to the desperate search for the missing University of Missouri student Riley Strain, his family making an emotional plea to the public for help. The 22 year old has not been seen since he was asked to leave a Nashville bar on March 8th. Here's ABC's Alex Perche. Tonight, the urgent search for 22 year old Riley Strain now missing for more than a week. As police reveal, they've discovered his bank card near where he was last seen. It's not getting any easier. No. Time, time seems like it's really to the critical point. And we just, we want to ask anybody if they know anything uh, to please share it. The University of Missouri student was last seen March 8th in Nashville while on a fraternity trip. Surveillance that evening showing him walking alone, stumbling and falling in the street. Earlier, Riley had stopped by this bar belonging to country music star Luke Bryan. 
The bar saying Riley was served one drink and two waters, and then our security team made the decision based on our conduct standards to escort him from the venue. It's been a week. We haven't heard his voice. We haven't gotten text from him. We're, we're ready. To, we're ready. Nashville police searching along the Cumberland River and talking to people living in nearby homeless encampments. We're utilizing absolutely every resource we can possibly think of at this point. Mary, tonight, Nashville police tell ABC News that the search continues and they're using boats with sonar in their river search. They also say they found no evidence of foul play, but they're open to all possibilities. Mary. Still so many questions, Alex. Thank you. We turn now to the housing market and that monumental settlement from a realtors group scrapping the standard 6% commission. But what does it all mean for buyers and sellers and how much could it impact home prices? The new details tonight from ABC's Alexis Christophorus. Tonight, a historic settlement is changing the way we buy and sell a home, the biggest overhaul in decades. In the coming weeks, a federal judge ruled sellers will no longer be required to pay both their broker and a buyer's broker, a move that could reduce the cost of buying a home. At today's standard 6% commission, a homeowner selling a $400,000 property will spend about $24,000 on broker fees, a cost that's passed on to the buyer. Depending on the new rules, that same homeowner could see the fee fall to about $12,000. The changes opening the door for alternative brokers like California-based Ariva, which charges buyers a flat fee of under $10,000. And I don't care if it's a $300,000 house or a $9 million house, it doesn't matter to us. We're basically doing the same amount of work. Tony Chang opted to use a flat fee broker last year when buying his second home in Northern California, a decision he says saved him tens of thousands of dollars. You know, I think a flat fee... Uh, buyer's agent structure is probably going to be the future. Thanks to online tools, some buyers may choose not to use an agent at all, which could result in fewer brokers. And experts I spoke with are skeptical the deal will result in a big decrease in home prices. They say that's set by supply and demand. But a meaningful drop in mortgage rates could have a larger impact on home prices. Mary? Buyers and sellers watching this closely. Okay, Alexis, thank you. Now tonight to the luck of the Irish and millions celebrating St. Patrick's Day. In Ireland, thousands of people lining the streets of Dublin there to take in the sights and those sounds. President Biden also honoring the day and his own heritage by welcoming the Irish Prime Minister to the White House. Also the fountain there on the White House lawn turning green to mark the occasion. And there is still much more ahead here on World News Tonight this Sunday. Millions in the East get ready to bundle up for the return of winter. So how long will it last? And the biggest blast yet from the volcano in southern Iceland. They're lighting up the sky. Next here tonight, a spectacular eruption. A volcano in southern Iceland spewing lava for the fourth time since December. This is, though, believed to be the largest eruption so far. Plumes of smoke and that bright orange glow of the volcanic activity lighting up the night sky. Officials issuing emergency warnings and evacuating the area, which includes the popular Blue Lagoon Spa. And when we come back, get ready for the return of winter. A look ahead to this week's forecast. To the index now, winter is returning for most of the eastern half of the country. Major cities all springing back to temperatures dipping below freezing. Parts of the south also on alert. Freeze and frost alerts into the early part of the week. Thankfully, though, temperatures return to normal later in the week. I'm Mary Bruce. Good night. Thank you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast.